the children's church right now if they'd like to. Have a big day planned for them back there. <coughs> Wayne, you ready? I am. Thank you. Let's pray for the speaker. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for Gary and thank you for his ability to preach. And we pray that as he uh, brings us a lesson today that he will speak the truth in love and that he will uh, remember the things that he has prepared and that uh, they will... Uh, Work on our hearts, bring us a stronger faith, and uh, make us more able to bring glory to you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Wayne. So good morning, everyone. Glad that you're with us today. To our guests, thank you for being here, coming down to the uh, Emerald Coast and having a, a big throwdown, I guess. Uh, sunny, warm Florida. Yeah, it, it'll come. It'll come. We are happy that you're here. So today is kind of a, a big day. It's a, a, a Super Sunday, right? Why is it a Super Sunday? No, not Super Bowl. We get to come worship God. What are y'all thinking? <laughs> get your mind off the football game. <laughs> that wasn't nice, was it? So... <laughs> It is a good day for us, good Sunday. We, uh, I remind you, we have our series coming up starting um, in March, uh, March 5th on the story. We'll have an introductory lesson on that this, the last Sunday of, of this month and then get right into it on the, uh, the first Sunday of March. We're really looking forward to that. So in the back, in the foyer, are, are these cards. And uh, that, that you can send your neighbors little postcards. All you got to do is put, put their address on there. And uh, we got 500 of these. And they're not going down as fast as what I'd hoped they would. But uh, you, you can always just put their current resident, send it to your neighbor. And they don't know it was you if, if, if you feel embarrassed to send them something. But uh, nevertheless, you can send those uh, to, to your neighbors. And then we have the flyer as well. That tells a little bit about it. So get some of those and uh, share them with your neighbors. Invite your neighbors to come and be a part of our series coming up, The Story. Okay? Good. Now I said that and all of y'all agreed and you'll do that. And I'm so grateful. I hope you'll do that. At least think about it. So today, as the last two weeks, we are going to be in the book of James. James is a book about maturity. It's a very practical book, very easy read, uh, if you will. And we're going to be looking a little closer at that today. I hope that, um, hope that you'll join with me. I'll have the scriptures on the screen, but uh, also, you know, you can look at them in your Bible. But I encourage you to read the book of James. Read it. It's, it's not that long, easy read, not any kind of uh, funny names that you're going to have to try to say as you're reading through there. It's very easy, very practical, and talks about being mature in Christ. Something we should all want to do. Now, as I was putting this together, and as I've been looking at James, and I was thinking about maturity, people maturing in Christ, and I reminded you a couple of weeks ago about Warren Wiersbe's book, uh, his commentary on James, and he entitled it, Be Mature meaning it is a book of maturity. But what, what I have honestly come to realize in my life and in my mind and my th way of thinking is some people don't want to be mature in Christ. They don't. And if that's you, then shame on you. <laughs> you shouldn't be that way. I'm going to point my finger. You should be growing up in Christ. But as I study today's lesson, which we're going to be talking about wisdom today, wisdom, has to do with maturity. The older one gets, hopefully the more wise they become. I say hopefully. <laughs> hopefully comes wisdom. With age, should come. Not always. Part of this is maturity. So I encourage you today, I encourage you today as we get started, I want you to really think about your life, your, 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 your walk with God, your spiritual life, where are you in your spiritual walk with God? I want you to think about those things. 
I'm going to tell you, I think we can all mature a little bit more all the time. But if you're one of those people that says, I don't want to mature, I want you to really pay attention and see why it, I want you to see the value of maturing in Christ, maturing in the Lord, growing in Christ, gaining, gaining wisdom. So let me start by saying this. If a genie appeared, a genie, Magic, you know, like a magic genie, like an Aladdin, and said, I can grant you one wish. What would that be? You got this one wish. I mean, fame and fortune, or what, 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 what is it that, 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 that you would like? Money, power, position? Would, it, would, would you want some kind of difficult situation resolved? You see, a situation like this happened in our Bible, in the Hebrew Bible. It was during a transitional time in the nation of Israel. King David had recently died. And there was a new king on the throne, David's son Solomon. 1 Kings 3, 5, God came to him in a dream and said, Ask for whatever you want me to give you. Ask. Came to him in a dream, told him that. No qualifications, nothing else. Solomon, Solomon could ask for the world. <laughs> but instead, Solomon, Solomon asked for something else. Continuing on there, 1 Kings 3, verse 7. Now, Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David. But I'm only a little child, do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? Yeah, I think it's safe to say the first act of wisdom that marked the life of Solomon was was his decision to ask God for wisdom. He asked him for wisdom. Now, let me tell you, there's a book out, it's entitled, it's several years old now, but it's entitled, How to Do Everything Right. I see a lot of cameras coming up to take a picture of that. It's on Amazon, actually. That's volume two there. You got volume one, right? It covers all kind of practical issues from taxes to travel tips and even tells you how to find lost contact lenses in your carpet. Uh, wouldn't it be nice to have a book like this just to simply know how to do everything right? We want to do it all right, make the right decisions. However, wisdom doesn't come that easily. Some issues can't be translated into black and white on a page. It doesn't have a chapter entitled How to Fix Everything That's Broken, including relationships and hearts and trust. Life isn't really that easy. And, and I don't think you could just get a few experts together and... and, and and start asking a few questions and have the answers why you, you couldn't even get the experts to agree on what the questions actually are. That's why James, James spends no little amount of time discussing wisdom in his book. Remember, in his letter, James is interested in telling us how to experience God, how to experience everyday worship. How to live life facing God. Remember who James was. Let me back up here a little bit in case you don't remember. James, more than likely this book, most scholars agree, was written by James, the brother of Jesus. He lived it right there with Jesus in his house. You know, I mean, there's Jesus. I mean, if he would ask the question, who do you think you are, Jesus? 
Yes, my son. <laughs> How awesome. Oh, and by the way, he wasn't a believer, you know, until a little bit later on. Then he became a leader in the early church. So, yeah, he's kind of got a front row seat to Jesus and his life. This morning we're going to look a little bit at James chapter 1. Just a few verses there. We looked at a couple of weeks ago, but mainly focus in on James chapter 3, 13 through 18. And I want you to notice something here. If you look at the passage in the Bible, you'll notice the words about wisdom in chapter 1 that we talked about are within his discussion two weeks ago, within his discussion, talking about suffering. Two weeks ago, we talked about, in James chapter 1, suffering. But he also talks about wisdom there. And I think you'll see that these will go hand in hand. I don't think there was any accident there on where his discussion was leading. Church, I believe that it can be in the middle of the hardest times that we need wisdom the most. When you're suffering through the pain of health tragedies, life and death decisions need to be made. When life has thrown you a curveball and the worst thing imaginable has happened and you need to decide how to respond. When your situation changes, such as losing your job or, or a loved one dies, you graduate from school, you go through some other type of transition, you're going to find yourself in a situation that calls for wisdom. Decisions need to be made. And you don't have that handy book on how to do everything right. So what do you do? James says that you should turn to God. So going back to James chapter 1 where we looked at two weeks ago, one, uh, verse 5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Okay, now, you know, that's a pretty pious sounding answer there. That's kind of a, a churchy answer. I, I don't, I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings here. Let, just hear me out. Um... We're so sometimes conditioned to hearing church-type answers that we repeat them without thinking. And You should ask God for wisdom. Okay, so, so you don't think that I'm a heretic. We should ask God for wisdom. And, th th I, and I'm not against this verse at all. Wisdom comes from God. We should ask God for it. But when somebody's going through a difficult time, you know, to tell me I just need to pray about it doesn't always do the trick. <gasps> really, preacher, you're saying that? Yeah, yeah. We do, we do need to pray about it. But let, let me continue with this a little bit. Um, let me continue with this. You'll see what I'm talking about. Because sometimes it seems very simplistic for something so many people they struggle with. And then we're looking for answers and we're wanting God to... You know, we want God to answer us. <laughs> You know, it would be nice sometimes if he wrote on a wall or there was a bolt of lightning or there was a, a street advertisement that told us, Gary, do this. Or if there was this huge white weather balloon floating over the United States that said, Gary, do this. Yeah, that would be... That would be nice. 
So how do we come upon the right answers? And that's the way many people determine what to do today is, does it feel right? Whew, does it feel right? Now, that can be deceiving. Boy, howdy. <laughs> that can be so deceiving. So as you look at what James said here about wisdom, you'll notice he didn't say, if any of you lacks answers, he should ask God. Not what he's saying. So God here is the one who's designed the universe. He set everything into motion, everything works. And he's the one who knows how you and I function most effectively with, within our world. If you'll think about it, and a couple of weeks ago I actually had it up here, James is kind of like the owner's manual of life. And if you follow your owner's manual, you buy an automobile, and you take out the owner's manual and you read it cover to cover. I, I do. I'm weird like that. I like to see what's going on with my car. And you know what you'll find? You'll sometimes find things you didn't know you had in your car. It's like, wow, look at this. I speak from experience. I have done that. Those seat heaters are wonderful on a day like today. Who would have known, you know? Look in the owner's manual. That's, that's, that's like this is right here in the book of James. So as I prepare lessons, I prepare sermons, I, I, I look, I have books, I have sermon books, I have commentaries, I go online, I look at other people's sermons, I read other people's sermons, I study different things. There's a lot that goes into a sermon. Do y'all realize that? I just don't go down to Walmart and buy a sermon. Some of you might say, could have fooled me. <laughs> don't be ugly. But I like to see what other teachers and preachers say. And, and if you look at other people's lessons, it's... Uh, they talk about this text and talk about asking God for answers. Should I buy this house? Should I take this job? Should I make this choice or that choice? Let me tell you, I don't think God is really in the real estate business. Now you say, you mean I shouldn't pray about buying this house or whatever? No, no, I am not telling you that. Don't walk out of here today saying, I've told you not to pray about anything. Pray about everything. I don't think God really cares where you live or what your job is. I think God cares more about you and your life and following Him than where your residence is. It is wisdom that God wants to give us, not advice. Now... Once again, yes, pray about things. But pray for wisdom in making decisions. God isn't so concerned about where you live as how you live. Not so hung up on what you do for a living as he is the kind of living that you do. So let's look at James chapter 3, 13 through 17. Who is wise and understanding? There it is. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in humility. It comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is, first of all, pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. So James here is defining wisdom as knowing how to live the way that God wants us to. That kind of wisdom. 
there's a difference in knowing how to, from, from knowing how to get ahead in life and how, how, how to be godly. Now, let me clarify something. There might be times where God might be interested in what house you live in. You know, stretching yourself. Let's say you're, you work part-time at a daycare. And your husband raises salamanders for a living. You probably can't afford a $2 million home. Y'all are looking at, seriously? Probably not. Wisdom. I don't think God is wanting us to be, to, to, to be stretched and overextended in anything that we do, whether it's a car or a house or anything else. He wants us to practice good stewardship. So yeah, I think God could have some concern there, and we should pray about those things, but also pray for wisdom. What matters more to God is the way that you treat people when you're behind the wheel than the kind of car that you're driving. I don't think he really cares, foreign or domestic. But how do you treat people when you're in that car? Another issue that's very important to understand out of this passage is it talks about being double-minded. James wants us to understand there's a danger of trying to straddle the fence here. You see, there's some people who try to double-dip their wisdom. They want the best of both worlds. <laughs> they want the best of both worlds. You see, some people, you might know some, they, they want just a, a little, bit of, little, little bit of religion, a smidgen of religion. To keep them out of hell. I just need a little bit of that. I'm not totally committed. Now they won't say that. But they want a little bit. They want a little bit. They even wear a shirt sometimes that says, I love Jesus. Because Jesus just looks down from heaven and smiles. No. There's not just having a little bit of Jesus. You're either all in or you're not. You're either totally committed or you're not. This is what I say. James says we're double-minded. And I think all of us sometimes have a, have a tendency to do that. So I don't want to beat up on just a few of us, but maybe all of us have, have a tendency to do that sometimes when we're only half-heartedly following God. So we're going to look back in the Hebrew Bible uh, once again and look at Solomon. We're going to look at Solomon. He had wisdom. But it seems like Solomon also tried to get ahead by other means. I think Solomon was a double-minded person in 1 Kings 11, 1 through 6. King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. They were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. He had 700 wives, a royal birth, 300 concubines. His wives led him astray. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father had been. He followed Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely, as David his father had done. So, see, God had told the nation of Israel that if they trust him, he's going to protect them. Simple as that. If you trust me, I will protect you from all the other nations that are trying to destroy you. And Solomon actually said he trusted God for protection. But he made these treaties with these other nations, uh, you know, just in case. You follow along here. 
he had 700 wives, 300 concubines, and that day most of these marriages were arranged to secure political alliance with foreign gov governments. It was a picture here of being double-minded, double-minded wisdom. Yeah, okay, God, you say you'll protect us, but, you know, let me just make sure, and I'll have some treaties with these other folks around us that you don't like. And I know that, but, you know, just in case. Solomon sought God with sacrifices. He even built the, the, the beautiful temple there in Jerusalem. But he allowed his wives, his political alliances, to persuade him to offer sacrifices to other gods. You know, want to be all inclusive here. And, and they're bringing their other gods. So, okay, we'll, we'll do that. Kind of a way, it looks to me, that Solomon had of hedging his bets just in case those gods turn out to be helpful too. You see, just a little bit, just a little bit. I want to make sure we're right on this. But you know, God doesn't want us to be like that. God wants us to be, to be full-time followers who are completely devoted to Him. And when we're single-minded in our devotion to Him, we become wise. doesn't mean we know all the answers to all the questions, but we become wise. So we're going to look real quickly at three ways for us to fully adopt the wisdom of God. The first one is allow God's Spirit to fill you. Listen to this. Allow God's Spirit to fill you. Let me say that again. Allow God's Spirit to fill you. beginning point of adopting God's wisdom is to completely give your life to Him. When we make Jesus our Lord, we're given an incredible gift, the Holy Spirit. John 14, 15 through 17, If you love me, keep my commands. And I'll ask the Father, He'll give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. And in this, the, the, this promise was fulfilled in Acts chapter 2, a verse I'm sure we're all familiar with. Peter replied, Peter replied, Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Church, that's great news there. We can, we can have the Holy Spirit living within us, allowing God's Spirit to live within us. That's the beginning of true wisdom. Next thing is knowing God's Word. You know, we're, we're taught, and the Apostle Paul says that the Word of God is a sword of the Spirit. Knowing the will of God, knowing God's Word, what does that mean? It means reading your Bible. It means studying your Bible. It means a lot of different things, actually. Knowing God's Word, you will always, and I say this without any reservations, you will always learn something new in the Bible if you will read it and study it. I promise you that. I've told a story. I've told a story back when I was getting Bible degrees, that we, we had to read the book of Luke every week in that class. And we had to come up with like five new things in, in a chapter we'd never seen before. And I thought, oh no, I'll never be able to do that. That was easy. Reading it over and over and over again. And, and then things pop out like, wow, look at that. I never saw that, but I never realized that was there. Learning, growing, growing in the Lord, knowing God's Word. Read your Bible. The psalmist says, Your Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Read it, study it, let it fill your thoughts as you pray. 
I encourage you, I encourage you, church, if you get a chance, you wonder where to start in the Bible, what you should be doing, go to the Psalms. Study a Psalm. Read a Psalm. And pray that Psalm. Try that. The third thing is, you know what? Listen to godly people around you. Sometimes, even when you got the Holy Spirit as part of your life, even when you know the Word of God backwards and forwards, there will be times to know what to do. Now, and I say this because we talk about having the Holy Spirit, a Spirit-filled life, and that is a great thing. But you, you, you know when, when something happens so close to you, so personal, so hurtful, you have the Holy Spirit and you can know the Bible Sometimes you need to talk to someone, and that's okay to do that. That godly person, someone you trust, someone you trust, somebody who is living, living a spirit-filled life. Sometimes in life we can, we can have blind spots. Proverbs 12 13 or 15 says the way of a fool seems right to him but a wise man listens to advice yeah find someone who is living the fruit of the spirit find that godly person that person that you can talk to you no know, if you've come here this morning looking for something to to make your life complete, to make you wise in getting through this life and into the next one, then there's one place to point you, and that is to look to God for everything. Once again, I did, I did not tell you don't pray about things. Yes, pray about things, but pray for wisdom. Don't look to God as an answer man in everything, but pray for that wisdom. Pray for God to give you answers. I think that's okay. Pray for wisdom. Pray for wisdom. Our God is so good to us. I believe God wants to give us things and be kind to us. He's loving. He's compassionate. And His will is to guide us through this life so that we can one day live forever with Him in heaven. Good news is that those who are wise enough to admit that they need His help will always find it. Church, the book of James is a great practical book. Once again, I encourage you to read that. Be wise. Be wise. Pray for that wisdom. Ask God to help you. Study God's word. Don't be asking for something that you know is not something in God's nature to give you or is against the will of God. In other words, should I leave my wife for someone else because I've taken a liking to her? And I prayed to God, and, you know, I just feel so good about this other person. God's not going to tell you to leave your spouse to go to somebody else. I don't think that's in God's nature to do that. I don't think that's in God's will to do that. Pray to God, ask for wisdom, talk to others, other godly people. We're all in this life together. Let's get through it together. Let's all meet together in heaven one day. Church, we're going to have an invitation song. Any of you would like to respond to that, you can. If you want to become a Christian, need to become a Christian, need to come back to the Lord, whatever it is, you can do that today. You can come forward. You know, people don't come forward a whole lot like they used to. Remember the days where there'd be droves of people coming forward? We don't do that so much anymore. That's a tradition. But you know, here at the Destin Church, you don't have to come forward. You want to get with me after worship service and talk and pray? We can do that. One of the elders, same thing. You want to talk about stuff? You want to be baptized? You want prayers of the church? Whatever it is, that's okay. You don't necessarily have to come down this aisle. 
I'm an introvert. I wouldn't care to walk down this aisle. Not if I was where you are. Now, right now, I'm okay. But the important thing is, is getting your life aligned with the will of God. That's what's important. And coming back to Him, if you need to come back to the Lord, whatever we can do, baptism, it doesn't matter. Whatever you need, we can do that for you today. To our guests, keep our bulletins. Got our phone numbers in there. If you need me, you call me. My number's in there. You can call or text me. My email's in there. Call, text, email, whatever. Our elders as well, get in touch with us. We're your church while you're visiting down here on the Emerald Coast. We're here for you. Call on us, okay? With that being said, if you have need of the Lord's invitation this morning, we invite you to come right now while together we stand and while we sing.